Hey, Miranda. Hi. Thanks for joining me. I'm so happy you could meet with me today to chat, um, mm -hmm. especially with all the craziness going on around us. Um, obviously, this is virtual because our life is virtual at the moment for everything. But I wanted to talk, fittingly enough, about isolation. Uh, I know that it's a big topic for a lot of us, especially women, when you work on our own and we're kind of our own little island. And normally we have these feelings of isolation and sort of not connecting easily with people around us, whether they're clients or other business owners or whatever. And now that we're currently kind of in this crisis with this viral outbreak, um, we're told to isolate ourselves even more. And so I know that's going to be a huge challenge. And it kind of seeps into this idea of how do we even get new clients if we're isolating ourselves intentionally? Um, how do we market ourselves? Do we need to change our business? But I think a lot of that comes down to um, just kind of breaking down this, this feeling of being isolated, kind of how do mm -hmm. we pass that? So um, you have a lot of experience with different businesses. You are a photographer of kind of all types, right? You do portrait photography, but you do also branding photography and you started doing a lot of branding work with your clients in recent years. So um, as somebody who's more experienced, I wanted to get your input on this so you could share with everybody. Um, so how are you dealing with this kind of forced isolation that we've kind of been put into? Well, it's interesting because one of the things that I do hear a lot from creatives is the need for connection in the community, you know, and I think as creatives, you have these natural periods of positive isolation for you to create and, and gather your thoughts or gather your, you know, materials and ju creative juices to be able to focus on something that you want to make. Almost um, like cycles. Yeah. I think it's, it, I think that, I think there's a positive side to isolation. I think we've given isolation sometimes a bad name. It's almost like the egg a few decades ago. They got a bad rap. You know, isolation can be a good thing. I think in a society that's bustling with, you know, so much stimulus, we're constantly being asked, bombarded. You know, we're expected to keep, you know, tabs on our inboxes all over the place, our Facebook, our Instagram, our you know, Vimeo, like all of these inboxes and phone numbers and, you know, emails. And so there's not a moment that we're not getting bombarded or requesting our attention. It's, it's, it's a constant in life, you know, yeah. um, that I think sometimes isolation can be a good thing. But then what happens is we tend to be a feast or famine, no pun intended at the moment, a feast or famine type of society where we have a hard time with living in the gray. We, we're very black and white. We either go all gun ho or nothing. And so as creatives, we start in this really positive place of isolation and it starts to really work for us. And then we kind of just let it spiral down to the point where we lose touch and we forget how to connect. And I think when it comes to connection, I think the bigger question is really understanding. There's a lot of dynamics. I, when I talk to people in their own businesses and their own personal life goals and things like that is I really like to get to know what makes them tick in the sense of what makes them productive, what drains them, what uh, fuels them, what excites them because so much of it is personality, preferences, skills that it, there's not a clean cut answer. Some people need more isolation than other people. Some people thrive on it, other people do not. And so knowing what level of connection you need and what connection is positive or productive, I should say, I won't say negative, but like productive, because I think sometimes we're told, well, you need to get out there and you need to hustle and network and, and go to socials and meetings and whatever. And you end up spending all this non-productive energy that doesn't fuel you. And other times we're like, well, you just need to focus and hunker down and schedule and get organized. And you get so caught up in that that you lose connection of, you know, the watering hole. You know, I think that people that work in corporate settings have, you know, lunch rooms and meetings that naturally tend to overlap with other people's lives. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they tend to be fueled by them or, or encouraged or inspired or whatnot, or supported. 
and as creatives that often work from home or work in their own studios by themselves or with a very small limited staff, it, it, it isn't something of a daily, it isn't a norm. And so even scheduling, even like some people are really early birds, other people are really night owls. And so these are things that I try to kind of peel away at when I'm working with someone because one thing, and especially as women, and you mentioned this, one thing we never give ourselves is permission to be. Yeah. There's a lot of guilt around not being able to handle it all. We have a really hard time asking for help. And so the world's weight is on our shoulders. If we can't handle it by ourselves, and so therefore that creates, impacts that isolation because we are connected with other humans that, that relate, you know, whether it be other women or just society as a whole. And so we don't ask for help. We don't know to take a break. We don't take days off. We can't say no to our clients because God forbid we say no. And so we don't take the time to really see what it is that we want to do, what we can do, what we should do, you know, just, and just because we can do something doesn't mean you have to do it or that you need to do it. But that, that, de that goes down a whole other wormhole of topics that you and I have often talked about in terms of, you said the imposter syndrome, the comparing, the, 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 the self-worth, all of those things. It all ties in together for sure. Yeah, it all ties in together for sure. And so now you compound it with times of, I won't say crisis, but times of community stir up with, you know, global issues and it only magnifies itself even more. And so, yes, money is the lubricant of the world, um, but, you know, knowing how to, and I'm a very like worst case scenario, best case scenario kind of girl. And I go through the full range. Okay, I die. Okay, what's gonna happen? Okay, nothing happens. And so I kind of to prepare for both. Yeah. And then I just kind of let it go. I let it go and I try to really look at the positive. And I, I learned being pregnant with triplets at one point as, as a single parent, that if I didn't learn to ask for help and accept it, I wasn't gonna make it. And so it's these times that really almost force upon us um, knowing who we are, what we need, and that it's okay to ask for help. And that isolation can be a good thing, but it can also be something that really affects us very negatively. So, yeah. Yeah, I think there's that, there's really that fine line between the isolation that you thrive off of and then the isolation that just kind of sends you a little bit down that down, the downward spiral. Absolutely. I think that's where a lot of us are really challenged is when we start, because once you start those negative thoughts, it's really hard to stop them, right? Like once you start kind of going down that negative road, it's really hard to stop yourself and think about all the positives. So um, what's some of the stuff that you found to be helpful? Like if you're in kind of that negative space, because I know it's so easy to fall into that, especially in the beginning of your business where there seems to be a lot of isolation and you're not quite, you don't have kind of your tribe of fellow business owners yet. And you're still sort of learning everything and it feels like an upward battle constantly. Um, what sort of stuff has helped you kind of not feel like you're isolated? Like has there been, have there been things that you've done to intentionally connect somehow? Well, that's been an interesting journey for me because there's, an, there's my experience as, a, as my own personal experience, mm -hmm. and then it's now seeing others go through it now. Now that I do coach and work with other people, it's been an interesting growth thing because initially, you know, we all have our own glasses on and we only see the world from our own perspective. And from my own perspective, I tend to be kind of a Pollyanna. I tend to make friends really easy. I, I go out and I mean, I will, I have walked across the street and said, do you have a roller? Cause I forgot to pick one up at Home Depot. You know, I'm one of those people that just I, not I, at all. don't feel embarrassed. I just ask, I'll ask a stranger, Hey, do you, you know, whatever. And so I'm extroverted. I'm positive. I don't give up easy. I'm very tenacious. And so what to me feels like isolation is more overwhelming. Mm. It's not finding the door. And wanting to be able to accomplish or do or say something and not having the words or the resources or the ability to get to that. That's usually my, it usually starts with frustration for yeah. me. Um, but for other people, what I've learned is that it, it's, it looks very different. So um, 
the thing that I do kind of find works in trying to navigate this topic with others is pulling it back and bringing it back to the core of what is it that, again, makes that person thrive? What is it that that person needs? What is the perspective? Why, you know, if they're really hung up on something like, no, it needs to be this way or I fail, just not arguing with them on that. Okay, okay, if it looks like that, you fail. But can you tell me why you feel that way? And can you tell me why that looks that way for you? And understanding that. And so one of the things that I don't think we give ourselves, it's easier to give other people, but if we don't give ourselves is we don't give ourselves grace. And we don't give ourselves time to know what we need. Uh, it, it took me many years. I was already an adult. It wasn't until I was going through a divorce and I was getting my hair cut one day and I was going off about, because I'm a talker, obviously, and, and I was like talking about how frustrated I was with, you know, my ex and whatnot. And, and my hairdresser says to me, what does Miranda want? And it was this moment of like, oh, oh, well, uh, yeah. Like I hadn't even for one second stopped to think what it was I wanted. And, and so again, back to, you know, societal pressures or just how we're raised or whatever. Um, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're someone that's been out on your own for a while, if, if you come from a culture that expects you to, you know, thrive independently, those pressures are self-imposed and those expectations are self-imposed. And if you ask anyone that sees you with love, eyes of love, they give us a heck of a lot more praise and grace and validation than we give ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so I have to dial it back. For me, I have to dial it back and be like, it's okay. I only accomplished one thing on my to-do list today or yeah, that didn't work out so well, or whatever it is that I am frustrated around, yeah. um, that I have to dial it back. I have to simplify it. Simplify it. I have to water it down. And you know, you, you hear discussions around this topic and people say, meditate or put it aside for a while, talk to a friend, you know, get a perspective. Like there's all these coping techniques, but what we forget to ask is, well, what works for you? Kind of like when you're dating, when you're mad, what do you need? Do you need me to hold you? Do you need me to walk away? Do you need to talk about it? Like, what do you need? And we don't do that for ourselves. We don't stop to say, what do I need right now? Do I need to talk, call up a friend and just vent or tell them I'm scared or ask for help or whatever? Do I need to just not think about it, not address it, set it aside, go, go do something else? Do I need to, um, I don't know if you can still hear me. I had a call come in. So. I can hear you, but your video just went out for a second, but you're back. Okay. Sorry. So, um, you know, what is it that you need in that moment to really make yourself move out of that to a productive place? Because if you're stuck in that kind of negativity or, or loneliness or isolation or frustration or whatever it is, anger, or whatever it is you're feeling, you know, lack of self-worth, you know, all of those things that we feel in that moment, What's it going to take to get out of that spot to then look at it with clean eyes to have a little bit more inspiration and positivity around it? And so it's not the same for everyone. And it, for some circumstances, even within your own life, it can look for some things you need this and for other things you need that. And so what I now try to coach people to look at is really knowing who they are and what they need, what works for you. Do you need a structured schedule and an absolute clean desk? Or do you need to work in the mess of it and be inspired in it all? You know, like yeah. what is it that works for you? And once you know that and allowing yourself the grace to set up a business or set up a life or set up a workstation or set up a marketing plan or whatever it is that you're trying to conquer or are thinking of taking on, you're going to know the formula for making that work. And it applies to whether you're ordering off a menu in a foreign restaurant or whether you're ordering, you know, uh, you know, new furniture for your home, like the same formula will apply or picking a new husband, you know, whatever it is, it's going to apply because you know yourself. Yeah. Um, that's so so interesting. That's, that's how I approach it is I, I start by giving myself grace because I know that if my friend walked in in that moment, they would not be giving me the hell that I'm giving myself. Totally. And then I, I, I then say to myself, what do, what do I need right now? And if you can then take it to the next step, and sometimes you don't have the words, but if you can then communicate it to someone who's a good listener mm -hmm. and knows you and gets you, then that's even better. But you're not always there right away and you're not always, you don't always have the words or maybe you don't have someone in your life that can be that bouncing board. But 
Yeah, I, I really sometimes, most of the time, sit there with my clients and they come in because they want to rebound their business or they want to do that. And after an hour, we find out that wasn't at all what the holdup was. That wasn't at all what the issue was that was keeping them from thriving. It was something completely different, but we unlock that one piece and bam, the floodgates are open. So especially now, this, I, this is the time for that. We have time now that we are forced in isolation. This is a good time for it. That's true. It's so interesting because um, I never really, I, I never thought of isolation that way. You know, you think isolation, you just think you feel alone. But first of all, I never realized that isolation would be different things for different people or that it would be different for introverts versus extroverts. I mean, I think it's sort of, it's sort of understood or taken for granted that introverts are more likely to feel isolated because just by nature, we just kind of don't put ourselves out there as much to actually make connections with people. Um, but I love the idea of isolation actually stemming from not knowing what you want or not being clear on what the root of it is. Because when I think back to moments where I've felt more isolated, it usually does go back to feeling like, like I want to do something, but I don't have the support or the knowledge on how to do it. Like, I, like I'm overwhelmed. Like, I don't know where to start. Like, I want to do this with my business. I don't even know where to go. I don't have the resources. I don't have the support system. I don't know the right people. And then it, you just kind of start to think about all the stuff you don't have or you don't know. And you start to feel like, oh my gosh, I'm so not connected to the people I should be connected to, but really at the root of it is just that overwhelm and that needing the resources and needing that clarity. Mm -hmm. It's not really about not having, yeah. people. it's not really about connecting with people. It, it is, but it's not, it's, right. it's really rooted in not having that clarity. And we, um, we as women definitely definitely like never ask ourselves what do I want we just never do we're always about doing stuff for other people and I'm a huge huge advocate of we're here to serve our clients but I do think that needs to be balanced with how do we want to serve our clients you know how do I want to show up for them how do I want to serve them so that's really interesting you know going into this conversation and going into like thinking about what we would talk about I didn't think it would really steer in this direction, but that makes total sense. So yeah, I've heard introverts say to me that they have felt very alone, even in the midst of being in, in large groups or in public settings, even those designed to support them, they've still felt very alone. Yeah. And very I unheard. Definitely, very I definitely felt that. Going to, going to these sort of networking events where you feel that you're supposed to be at them because that's what a business owner does, right? You go to these networking events and you okay. hand out your business card. But I've been to so many of those events where I'm in a room full of people and I may as well just be alone in a dark room. Like it's just, you don't feel like you're really connecting to anybody in any, in any way at all. Yeah. There's not a mean, it's not meaningful connection. Um, right. I, I definitely, find that even for extroverts, not just introverts, I think that understanding um, a quality, meaningful connection versus one that's just, you know, spinning your wheels and not productive. And I think that kind of that boiling it down philosophy for me has really helped because through my life, I've kind of been someone with nine lives. Like I felt like there's all of these things that I want to do. Like people that say, I'll say, what is your hobby? What do you want to do in life? They're like, I don't know. I don't really like anything or I don't really have hobbies and I'm like are you kidding me I'm like can you take five of mine because there's all these things that I want to do <laughs> that I would enjoy doing that I know that I'll probably die not get to do all of them I want nine lives right yeah. and so for me it was like it was about um understanding and you and I have had a lot of friend to friend conversations where I'm like this is what I want to do and this is what I'm doing and you know this whole like dichotomy of like what does it all mean? And for me, I had to boil it down. And it's like, I, and I used to tell people this, divorce the job title and marry the skill set, Or in this, some cases, marry the passion or the drive behind it. So for me, and I tell people I am the cockroach of business, I can sell tacos on the corner. And I, you've, I probably, you've probably heard me say this, 
it really doesn't matter at the right now I happen to be holding a camera and I do coaching as well but it, like that does not define me what defines me is is that I love people I thrive when they thrive and when I have a hand in that I'm kind of like people's little cheerleaders I love edifying others when I can build someone else up and then they go out and conquer the world that just makes my day in fact I have my clients often send me a little video or like call me the minute they make their first dynamic ginormic sale for them and we all do the happy dance and I'm a hobby because that makes my entire day mm -hmm. that just really and so when I boil that down it's like well do I need to be holding a camera for that? Do I need to be a coach for that? Do I need to, could I scoop ice cream at Thrifty's and hand it to a child that's just wide-eyed and totally happy? And could that bring me joy? Could I make flowers? Could I, you know, there's a bazillion things. And so now all of a sudden my world is my oyster because I really could do anything. And I've already had these thoughts even the last week. Like, you know, what if this whole thing in the world decides that I'm not going to be a photographer anymore? What else could I do? I'm like, I could sweep streets. I could sing songs as I do it and cheer people up. Like I, all these ridiculous yeah. things through my mind, but I think like it's because I've divorced the job title and the, in the, 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 the ideas that have been set for me on like, this is who I am and this is what I do and blah, 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 blah. And, and, and those things are good when you're coming up with a business statement, but I think it's also good as a person to know, I, I even do that with my own parenting role with my children. You know, I birthed my children, these are my children, this is my role, but this is also who I am in that. And so that frees us up so much because then you don't have those restrictions of, I am a photographer and if I'm not booking all these clients and I'm not able to pay the bills and I have to shut my studio down, I'm a failure and oh God, now what am I gonna do? No one's booking me. I'm like, you know what, I will go work at Starbucks. I will go, you know, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. At some point, someone will hire me and I will pay the bills. I will downsize. I will sell my car. I don't know. I'll yeah. figure it out. And so that pressure during good times and bad times lives for me. And I'm able to see it with different eyes. And so then I don't feel so frustrated and upset and fearful and isolated. And so in a perfect world, um, of course, we want to stay our course and we're doing something because we love it and we want it to succeed and we don't want to be scatterbrained all over the place and one day you sell tacos and the next day you're a photographer we don't want that but but to know that i have the freedom to sell tacos tomorrow and i don't know why tacos i always use that analogy Maybe is I because i figure everybody's eat i should be able to make a taco i feed my kids you know someone will buy the taco those things are completely lifts it for me and I don't feel so alone and I probably figure there's five other people that want to sell tacos on the street too because they're trying to feed their families and and all of a sudden it it's less intense and isolated and sad and scary and and, and depressing and like and so hard on ourselves because it's whenever we have to look at our life that way we feel that we fail and again especially as women we feel like we failed as a mother, we failed as a business owner, we failed as a wife, we failed as a whatever, a creative, and we put that on ourselves, yeah. and that is what ultimately tears us down and doesn't lift us, you know? Well, and I think especially when we work for years to build something up, and we're like just at a point where we're, we're like, okay, finally, it's starting to be like a real thing that's actually paying bills and actually like a legit business, and, and suddenly you have to consider either not walking away from it but you have to consider not being wholly devoted to that and opening the door to something else so what would you say because i know a lot of folks and and this would be a thought that would cross my mind is if if i would say oh but i'm an interior photographer that's what i do how can i take focus off of that and then just go sell tacos like <laughs> it's there's a part of it that's about the image that others see but then there's also a part of it like you want to kind of keep everything on brand so to speak you want to kind of be like well that doesn't make sense like am i walking away from it am i doing it part time now um what do you say to those kind of thoughts i mean i know that that's a lot of it is this idea that you're talking about which i love of walking away from the title like divorcing the title and marrying the passion or the skill set, which 
is a huge mindset mindset shift that I do think makes a massive difference when you're not so caught up on what's your title, but you're caught up on what do I love and what do I do for people? What is the root of what I do? Um, Cause for the Grove, it's, I'm the same way as you where I, I've literally cried over emails that I've gotten from people when they say like, Oh, I had my first photo shoot with a client and they were absolutely over the moon about it. And I get tears in my eyes because they're thanking me for being able to do that. Um, that's the whole reason I started it is because it's lifting others up. Um, but it took me probably seven years to get to a point where I understood that I was supposed to be other people's uplifter <laughs> and cheerleader and all that. Um, but there's still this idea of like, especially right now, you know, if I say next week, you know, I can't pay the bills, I have to go work at Starbucks. Right that's a tough pill to swallow for, for a lot of people. Um, what's, what and I, don't, I don't suggest to look at it that way. And this, the reason I say that is because my skill set lies around customer service. It's the people that I love is that I'm after. So in your situation and you've kind of done, done it, I don't know if it was intentional or kind of by default, but your passion Natalia lies in your passion and love for architectural, like design like architect. And so you went from, you know, studying, being an architect, you know, all of that to you're still doing that. You're just happy to be pointing a camera on it. And anytime I've spent time with you, you're like, oh, oh, look at this building. Look at the design. I mean, you could easily say, okay, I'm not getting the clients. I'm booking right now. I am still a photographer that specializes in interiors. And, um, and I teach others how to, to, to do that, um, to, looking at your industry of like, okay, the passion is really the, whether it's the interiors or the architecture around it or the design, what other roles within that industry could you fill that are somewhat related? So maybe, I don't know, maybe you decide to become a tour guide and you visit all the amazing buildings there are to be seen in the city. And oh, by the way, I also do photography and I can lead photography tours of really cool architectural spaces in this city. You know, like, Yes, it's not an interiors design, like an interiors photographer, the way we think of it, but you're still pursuing very much. It's still the same thing as what you went to school for. It's just, and so for me, when I look at every job I've ever had, every job I've ever had, and every, every you know, every time I took on a major at school, because I did switch majors three times, all the, the connecting line was that it was all service oriented. It was all about serving others to grow. And it always had a, educational component to it and it was always about creating an opportunity for others to create something meaningful so it's always about the idea of creating something meaningful that will last the test of time and whether that means within an individual or a tangible item like a photograph it, it really hasn't changed even though I'm, I'm kind of like you know have all of these things that I've done in my life it's really I've done the one thing I've just done it in very different things. So when I say I go sell tacos or, or Starbucks, it's not that I'm going to be a culinary chef or that I'm going to, that's not my passion. Um, I'd rather eat the food than make it, to be honest. But to me, it's handing it to someone, smiling at them, making their day. That's the part that doesn't change. And it's the same as handing them a photograph to me. If I impact their day and then they go and do something great in their life, it's yeah. still the same formula. And so... I do think that it's hard because we get really sentimental about things as well as like, well, I've gone to school to be a photographer. I've, you know, I've put my home, I've taken a loan against my house to build a studio to be a photographer. I've got so much vested so many years. And I think it's not about abandoning the idea as much as morphing it. And a good example of this is when digital came into being, all of the photographers that were, that had studios that were film based, mm -hmm. those that embraced digital and got super excited about another way to create ha have now expanded their studios have gone on to now be educators they're on the circuit many of us know you know many of them by name um that have just continued their career creating in a very different way with new mediums of technology they've embraced it those that refuse to morph and refuse to adapt and refuse to look at the opportunities within that change have had to close their studios, they became obsolete, they may no longer even be doing photography. So it's more about looking at what you do on a daily, whether it's a personal level or a professional level and saying, 
being kind of the chameleon of things. It's not that you're abandoning your, you know, all of a sudden, like you said, you're a taco salesman and then now you're an interior designer. It's more about knowing, going back to that, knowing the core of what it is you love to do and what does that look like in different phases of your life? Because you're also going to change, not just the industry and not just the environment and world of economics, but you're also going to evolve. Like me, I just really don't have a desire to be on my knees photographing brides anymore, but you know, it, it evolves. I still have a passion for the bride. I still love her. It's just, I don't want to be on my knees anymore, you know? So it's one of those things that I just said, well, how can I still service the bride without being on my knees? Well, I can just do the portraits. I don't have to do the whole day. I don't have to chase her around all day long. I can, I can specialize in the portrait or I could be the coaching person that helps this couple plan a really amazing wedding. You know, like there's pieces of that, that I still get fulfillment from. Right. And so as a professional, we really have to dial that back down and say, what piece of this excites me and what, what could that be applicable to and what could that look differently? And for some, that opens the door to multiple streams of income. Mm -hmm. It opens the door to maybe a part-time job. I don't know why we're looking at part-time jobs as a negative failure stigma right now because we're not full-time in one thing. Um, it could also open the door to being part of the force that changes the industry, mm -hmm. you know, like maybe you decide you decide you're going to design a camera specifically to photograph buildings. I don't know. You're now going to be part of the design team for that or something. Right. So these are the, the, the thoughts we need to have is to be able to step away from it and don't get so emotionally invested of like, I'm not the top fine art portrait photographer in the city of Long Beach, then I've failed. But instead of like, you know, what is it that I love doing? How can I do it? Am I holding a camera or am I coaching or what am I doing? You know, and when you do that, there comes a lot of freedom. And it also means that you could have more revenues of income coming your way and more opportunities. And I call it not putting all your eggs in one basket. So it gives you that growth. Oh, no, I am all about multiple streams of income. You know that. Absolutely. So, absolutely. I yeah. think um, one thing that was coming to mind while you were talking about how when you shift your mindset from one to the other, mm -hmm. it opens up all these, these possibilities. Um, a lot of it really does come down to ego and just kind of what, what we, how much we put on this title and how much we put on this sort of persona that we think we're going to be by being this business owner that does this and has this title. So I, I see a lot of that as sort of, as just ego, you know, we get caught up in what we think we're supposed to be and look like and what we're supposed to do on a daily basis and how we're supposed to dress and this and that. And, um, and it's so not about that. It's about getting past that and getting to the root of why you're doing what you're doing and what it is about it that, that drives you. So I, yeah, I love it. And it totally does open up multiple streams of income. I'm the same way where I've had sort of a variety of jobs in my past. And it wasn't until probably last year that I realized, because I always thought that they were all very random and very different. And it wasn't until last year that I realized that they're actually all very connected and they all sort of blend into what I do now. Because in the past, yeah, I, I was an architect, but I was also a substitute teacher at high school. I was also a elementary Spanish teacher for a semester. I was also a graphic designer for oh signage on buildings, light up signage. Um, so I've had these sort of, but they've all been dancing around um, buildings and educating. And I've realized that a lot of what I do now at the core, it's about design and educating, giving resources, being that person that educates and lifts others up, but the, it's all related to design, the design world. So, um, but it literally took me until I was 40 years old to be like, oh, that makes sense. Huh. <laughs> Maybe it's not so random that I was doing all that stuff. But at the time, I thought I was just sort of floating from opportunity to opportunity. And, um, and that, all, I mean, we're kind of touching on so many different things, but that also touches on what I've always believed is huge, which is just sort of trusting the universe, trusting the universe or God or whoever you believe is kind of that higher power. Um, 
just trusting that you're where you're supposed to be. You're, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and it'll be fine. You'll be fine. Things will work out. Um, always, what's the alternative? There's always a couch you can sleep on. There's always a family member that can lend a hand. There's always a job that will pull through. There's always, it'll be fine. But um, that's been kind of a, a lesson that's popped into my life at different points to sort of remind me like, see, you had no idea what was going to happen, but it worked out. And that's happened to me a few times. So I think- And all of it was you to make who you are now. Every little bit of that is the cumulation, what's the word? Cumulation, cumulation? Culmination. Culmination. <laughs> of all of that came together to form who you are now, to be able to do what you're doing now. And without one of those pieces, it would be the same. Totally. And if I didn't have all those crappy clients and crappy experiences and that terrible job as a graphic designer that I hated for four years, I would not be right here where I am. So yeah, it all plays into it. But um, I think a lot of that is in retrospect. I don't think in the moment we tend to see that. But, um, but yeah, I love the idea of divorcing the title and marrying your passions or your skills. All right, without people. Yeah. yeah. Without the label. And I know we're big on labels. We, we kind of had a running joke about you like the made up labels. And, and I know it's important to be focused in your business and especially in your marketing and branding to really have a concise, like what you do and who you do it for. And, and that's not what we're saying. Um, you, you don't want to be, you know, the Thai restaurant that sells donuts and do shoe shining. You don't, you don't want to do that, but, but you do want to know the why and, and, and that will get you farther than, or further than, you know, than, than the label or the title. And I'll give you a funny story. Um, one of the sweetest memories I have of my father is that he's a storyteller, sometimes for his benefit and sometimes not so much. But growing up, he used to do this thing, which I also did with my children growing up, is that I'd, he'd say, once upon a time, there was a chicken. And then we'd have to fill in the blank. And then he'd continue. Oh, and I'd say, that was red. And he'd say, once upon a time, there was a red chicken. And he'd continue the story. And so we loved these stories. And they'd go on in my mind as a child. It was one of my most favorite things that dad would do with us, right? And I fell in love with the idea of storytelling. And, you know, and I know that's kind of a buzzword now in today's industry. You know, I'm a story, I'm a visual storyteller, blah, blah, blah. And I always think it's such a cliche thing, but I would lay there and I would picture these things. And I would just fall in love with the idea of a story. Well, it wasn't until, and I want to say it's been within the last year that I said, somebody said, oh, you're a videographer, right? And I said, no, 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 because they had fallen in love with some of the videos that I created for families. And, and uh, I do editorial films and they said, oh, you're a videographer. I said, no, no, I'm not a videographer. And, and they're like, but you make stories and video. And I said, yeah, no, I'm not a videographer at all. If anything, I do photography, right? And so I was going through some stuff, cleaning up my website, and I realized that on my about page, there's a video, a very old one, so don't go look at it, but it's very old and needs to be updated. And in that video, the footage that is taken of my childhood, mm -hmm. I took. <laughs> I took the footage that's in my about video that I did when I was like 10. And, and I wasn't at that moment going, I'm gonna be a videographer, and I, and I never thought of even doing video because I always found it so complicated. And here I am, you know, however many years later, um, doing visual stories, both photographically and, and that I'm now carrying that on to helping, like we did a video for you to tell who you are and, and, and branding, right? And so I thought, oh my God, kind of like you, like here, some random thing in my life, non -real, what I didn't think was related, has actually come full circle around to now be part of what I do for clients and what I do in my life at this present time. And, I see that so often again and again and again. Um, one recently was a client that loved to draw and paint and she'd started a photography business. She's very successful. She does gorgeous work and she was struggling with the idea of not doing photography anymore or doing photography differently. And when we did about our second session, we boiled down to the fact that, oh, it's not that you want to do this it's that you want to take a picture of someone and then you want to draw them. And I was like, you know, and she was like, bling, 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 bling. So all these years of art school and all these drawings and all these things, 
it just, it was like never an option in her mind that she could actually do both, that she could blend them or that they were somehow a unique, unique service that she could offer her clients that no one else was offering. And so it, it's one of those moments where like, if you could just take a, a minute to, to water it down and look at the essence of the things that you've been really excited about in your life and probably nine out of 10 times, you're going to find that they're not all very different. They're, they're very alike. They're not all that different from one another. And that they've all kind of built along the way to bring you to this point. Totally. And, and more importantly, that that same concept can carry you forward. It can carry you through hard times. You'll land back somewhere in that space, regardless of the financial economy or, or you know, choices that you make career-wise. You'll, you'll somehow gravitate back to that. Because that's what your passion is. That's what you're drawn to. That's what you like. I mean, I can't tell you how many blue items I have in my wardrobe and I swear I'm not going to buy another blue item, <laughs> but somehow I gravitate to that blue item. You know? so, it's who we are. Oh yeah. my gosh, totally. Okay. So, um, I feel like we covered a lot of stuff for people. So kind of the takeaways, if somebody's feeling sort of isolated, um, what I've gathered is you can do sort of connecting with online communities and set up video chats and all that, which is all fantastic. But I feel like a lot of it comes down to sort of really getting introspective and asking, um, what do I want? Not what does the business want? Not what does my audience want? Not what does the culture want? But asking yourself what you want and, um, and why, which I think is probably the most important part. Why do you want that? Why do you gravitate towards that? why do you like what you like to do or what do you, why do you like your business or the service that you provide? Cause I feel like the why as cheesy as it sounds, you know, we've all heard about starting with the why, but um, it took me a long time to figure out my why, but, <laughs> but I feel like why you're doing things is what's going to give you the most answers and yeah. And being purposeful about it. So if you decide I need to get out and connect in the community or call a friend or whatever, knowing the why again, like you're saying, like being purposeful. I'm going to call Natalia. I need to bounce some ideas off of her because at the end of that conversation, I need to make a decision on X or Y. And then that helps me feel a little bit more fulfillment and, and purposeful in that process than just, Oh, I'm just going to go grab coffee with my other friend. And I chatted away an hour and a half, but I walk away still feeling extremely alone or frustrated or stuck, you know? Right. So be purposeful about once you know the why and you do decide to go out and, and connect or, or do something about it to be purposeful and intentful on why you're doing it. Yeah. Makes sense. And then also I feel like, um, letting go of the pride, the pride that comes from whatever title you gave yourself, the pride of not wanting to ask for help or not wanting to ask for resources. I feel like sometimes I know I've done this in the past where I'll just stop myself from reaching out and saying like, Hey, I just want to talk. Like, I just want to talk or, Hey, I don't know what to do about this because we just feel like maybe we shouldn't have questions or like we shouldn't not know that. Or, you know, like we just, I think we tend to think that we stop ourselves too much because we're afraid to ask for help or be weak or I don't know what it is, but I think a lot of it is like, we don't pride. have it all out. Like, Oh, if we ask for help, then right. how could it be the hot shot photographer or the, the, you know, business owner that's got it all together. We're not this kick ass CEO who's got it all together. <laughs> so right, right. I think kind of letting go of that, that pride is kind of a big part of it too. And realizing like human. We're all human. And we have good days, bad days. And I, I think to I, of the people that I gravitate, you know, people that are my mentors or people that I look up to in the industry that have double or triple the years that I have in the industry. And, and the things that have connected me and inspired me the most is when they say, yep, I'm not booking anyone this month either. You know, like I think we all hear about $5,000 sales and then like, ooh, I'm booked out into December. And that's all great. I think we should celebrate each other. But I think, and not that we want it to be a complaining and venting fest all the time of negativity, but I think just to say, 
yeah, this month has been a little slow for me too. And that that's okay. That doesn't mean you're not a good photographer or you're not a good business owner. It just means that for whatever reason, it happens to you too. And that normal business goes like this. And it, it yeah, that pride of just letting it go. Yeah. I think for me, one of the biggest kind of eye opening moments I had was, I think I've told you this before, when I was early in my business and I was part of a, like a female co-working space. And I remember at first being so intimidated by a lot of the other members of the co-working space because they all were a little bit older. They seemed like very corporate and very like established and business-like. And here I am in like my t-shirt and jeans and flip-flops. And I felt so like young and artsy compared to them. And, um, and I remember one of the first times that I heard one of them talking about how they didn't know something or like just realizing that they had no idea what they were doing and they were kind of making stuff up just as much as I was that they were just kind of winging it with their business. And I was like, but you're supposed to have it all together. Like, don't you know all the answers? And just realizing that they were making it up as they went just as much as I was like, none of us have, have everything figured out. Right. We're all just kind of making it up as we go. And for me, that was huge. Cause I was like, if these women who are so like with it and together and so polished and like classy looking, if they don't know what they're doing, then I'm good. I'm fine. <laughs> I'm have you seen the politician? No. No, there's a scene where they brought on Bed Midler and it's a young politician and she's the old politician, she's the old mayor or whatever. And there's a fantastic scene that speaks to that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And she's of course, you know, ran a term undefeated for God knows how long and, and yada yada yada. And here comes this new politician that that basically is only one class president in high school. You know, and so it was this idea that that this political campaign or party group knew it all and then yeah, yeah and then here's Ben Midler it's it's hilarious and it, it it shows that and I tell actually people this all the time you know we see these celebrity photographers or you know people that are traveling the world and they're very renowned and well-known and amazing in their own right um but I tell them I think about it this way they have bigger bills bigger pressures they have to outdo themselves every single time like I just have to outdo my little old self like you know I'm a big fish in a, in a little pond uh, in this city you know they're on a global scale so when you think for one minute that they don't have those jet lag days frustration burnout the thought that maybe they're too old or that they've done this a lot too long or that they don't have anything more to contribute just know they have it just like you they just have it on a bigger scale yeah. And Frank, some days I'm glad I'm in a little pond. <laughs> it's actually less pressure. Totally. So, yeah. So, yeah, by all means, anybody that, that that's ever had an interview with someone that's been up there well-renowned will say, I still get nervous when I go on stage. I, I still have those thoughts. I still have bad days. I still, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, Adele speaks to that and it's pretty funny. And she's like, yeah, here's me, my cheeky self. And I just loved her even more for that she was being real about the fact that no she doesn't have it all put together her makeup doesn't always look perfect and, and that's what makes us relatable and that ultimately is what makes us the most effective and more real to our clients now that's not to say we should show up with curlers and and vent about our kids for half an hour with every client but sometimes them knowing that you know yeah i'm dealing with teenagers is all you need to know they need to know and that makes you relatable totally. so Totally. Absolutely. Take a minute to just remember that. And when you're feeling, and really it's about, it's less about them and it's more about you. It wasn't about those cool ladies. It was about you feeling like you weren't worthy to be there. Well, I was totally projecting all of my insecurities on them thinking, and I was just assuming that they were something that they totally weren't. I mean, they were fantastic business owners in their own right, but yeah, it was completely my insecurities. Mm -hmm. And yeah. usually it is. It's usually we make it about ourselves and we make it about our insecurities and when we can just get over ourselves for a minute and dial it down and say, what is it that I need? And maybe all you needed to know is how, what do you bring to this puzzle and how can you contribute and 
how what piece of this do you bring that's all you really needed but instead it was easier to look at them and be like oh my god i'm not worthy you know yeah so exactly all, for sure all right so i'm gonna wrap it up because i think we've been talking for like a long time so uh thank you so much for sitting down for the interview. Um, we covered a lot more than I thought we would cover. So I think people are going to really get a lot of good juicy bits from this. And I think a lot of it is information that's really pertinent right now, especially with people kind of freaking out about the future of their business and kind of what they can do and how they're going to shift things. So um, I think a lot of it is going to be really reassuring, hopefully, that we're kind of all in the same boat and there are options and it'll be fine. It'll be okay. It will, it will be fine. I promise. I, it will definitely be fine. And if not, we could all go sell tacos. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Because you got to eat, right? <laughs> and who doesn't love tacos? Who doesn't love tacos? <laughs> so I'm going gonna, um, gonna to share with everybody Blossom Blue Studios um, website and all your info, your social links and all that good stuff so that they can check you out. But thank you, Miranda, for sitting down with me. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me. It's always absolutely you're my first interview on the Grove. Oh my god, I feel so honored. I had no idea. I might have done my hair. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what we're about here. I mean, you can see I'm in my hoodie today on a super cloudy day in what apparently is a very dark bedroom. I didn't think it was that. You know, dark. I, I covered the light, thinking it was going to be backlit, and now it's like a little too dark. But anyway, thank. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Absolutely. All right. Awesome. Love you. Thank you so Love much. You too. And um, yeah, I'll give your my readers all your links and stuff. And Thank you. we'll see you online. Okay. Take care. You too. Bye.